As promised, I have finally gotten my hands on the all-new 2019 GMC Sierra AT4. This video is going to be a little bit different than normal for a few reasons. The first and most important of those is that this pickup truck is targeted exactly at my demographic. I live out in rural California, the nearest paved road is about a mile away from my home. And just to give you a little sample of what I had to do in order to actually get to the filming spot where we film pickup trucks, which happens to be right next door to my home, let's roll that clip right here. Now does that mean that the AT4 is the ultimate off-road truck? The answer is easily no, but the AT4 is the kind of vehicle that straddles the line pretty perfectly between civility and capability. This is the kind of vehicle targeted at someone that wants to use their off-road pickup truck as a daily commuter, but wants a little bit more off-road ability than a standard 1500 truck would offer, and someone that values factory warranties on everything because you could get a lower end trim of Sierra or a Silverado or a Ram or a Ford F-150 and then do an aftermarket lift to it, uh, add some of the capabilities that we find on this truck, etc. but it wouldn't be warranted the same way that a factory off-road package would be. The other reason this video is gonna be a little bit different is that all of you had the opportunity to ask me questions about the AT4 in advance, so we're gonna try and run through those questions in this video. As a result, again, we're gonna be skipping over a lot of the things that we normally cover. Up front, the GMC Sierra definitely looks rugged. The model that we're driving has full LED headlamps right there. And since this is the AT4 model, we have red tow hooks at the bottom. That definitely distinguishes this from the lesser trims. The most frequently asked question that I got about the AT4 is what exactly is the AT4 package and how does it compare to a Sierra 1500 that just has the off-road bits that are available in some of the other trim levels? Well, the answer is that the AT4 is actually a better value than going down one trim level and then adding everything that you see on this model. We have a two inch lift in this vehicle versus the average ride height. We have off-road oriented tires. There are actually some more aggressive tires available as well. Monotube dampers. Under the body, we get skid plates, and then we get a locking rear differential in the AT4 model. Basically, everything that you see here is available one trim down in the lineup. However, if you were to choose those options from the factory in that lower end trim, it would actually cost you about $300 more. And then we wouldn't get the unique interior treatments that we get in the AT4 or the unique exterior treatments like those red tow hooks up front. What about making these modifications aftermarket? Well, that actually could save you a little bit of money depending on what you're after. The two inch lift, for instance, would be about $700 for a two and a half inch lift kit aftermarket. You'd then have to have it installed, perhaps another $700 there, $1,400 total. You could then add skid plates on your own for a few hundred dollars. You could also paint your tow hooks red if you wanted to. A little bit trickier to modify aftermarket would be things like the hill descent control, which this vehicle does have and is available in those off-road packages in other trims, but you couldn't really add easily aftermarket. And of course, the locking rear differential. You could add something like a limited slip or a mechanical locking differential aftermarket, but the electronic locking one is not going to be as easily added aftermarket. Then there is the warranty consideration. Everything that you see on the AT4 is fully warranted. And GMC even offers a cat-back exhaust and intake upgrade that will boost your power slightly that is also covered by a factory warranty. So if you want this kind of off-road capability or a little bit greater off-road capability with the optional wheel and tire package, this is going to be an excellent option that will keep you within the factory warranty. The more you modify the vehicle aftermarket, generally speaking, the more concerns you may have later in life about warranty claims. The AT4 is one of the trims that gets the GMC Multi-Pro tailgate. This is not available in all trims, and interestingly enough, it's not available in the Chevy Silverado either, which I really think is a pity. The tailgate has several different modes. This one right here allows you to put longer items into the truck and still have them at this level. It's actually the same level that you'd get if you put two by sixes in those slots right there in the bed. You can then pull this tab right here and hike this section up so that way it'll retain those items in the bed right there. We can also lower the tailgate right like normal. We can click on the upper button when it's in that position, lower it down, and then we get a very sturdy step. This makes it a lot easier to get in the bed of your pickup truck than those Ford assist steps that we see. Uh, we also have this pop-up handle right here to help you get up into the bed a little bit more easily, but there is one flaw. If that is up in that position, and then we close the tailgate all up, 
you'll notice that we can't actually put this handle down. Uh, yeah, that'll actually bop the tailgate right there. So we'd actually have to lower the tailgate, which we can do by pressing those two buttons either simultaneously or right in line, and it will actually drop both sections down. If you're a tailgate partier, you may be interested in the optional Bluetooth sound system that's positioned between this fold up and down step right there and then the actual sheet metal of this top end section right there. But there's one thing that you should keep in mind. If you're the kind of person that likes to keep your tow hitch and ball attached to your truck, then this will end up bopping it because when that is dropped down, then there's only about half an inch of clearance between that hitch receiver and this portion of the tailgate right here. So if you tow frequently, this is an important thing to keep in mind. The Sierra will shortly be available with a whopping total of six different engines under the hood, including a diesel engine, a 2.7 liter four cylinder turbo, and then the two engines that we're looking at here in the AT4, a 5.3 liter V8 and a 6.2 liter V8, which is the one that we have our hands on this week. Both V8s under the hood of the AT4 get General Motors' latest fuel saving technology. They call it dynamic fuel management. Instead of talking about power numbers, let's talk about dynamic fuel management because a lot of folks had questions about this. General Motors V8 engines in their prior generation of Sierra pickup truck had cylinder deactivation. They called that active fuel management or AFM. DFM is very, very different. AFM, also known as cylinder deactivation, deactivated the same four cylinders all the time. So when the engine went into fuel saving mode, it turned into a V4 engine, turned off the same four cylinders while the other four cylinders picked up the load. Although not quite as efficient as a four-cylinder engine, a V8 with cylinder deactivation ends up saving fuel because we get slightly reduced pumping losses by not actually having the valves open in those four cylinders. And then they're able to operate the other four cylinders at a more optimum air-fuel ratio mix. The trouble with deactivating the same four cylinders every time is that you can end up with some funky engine harmonics. You'll notice that both in the exhaust note and in the overall vibration level that we get in the vehicle. We see exactly the same thing under the hood of the Ram 1500 with its 5.7 liter Hemi V8 that uses cylinder deactivation. Again, the same four cylinders get deactivated every time. But for the 2019 Ram and the 2019 Silverado and Sierra, GM and FCA went about trying to rectify this in very different ways. The Ram 1500 gets active noise cancellation to try and cancel out some of those exhaust harmonics, and then it gets active shake weights that are mounted to the frame of the vehicle to counteract the vibrations that you can get in four-cylinder mode. That allowed it to expand the operation of that four-cylinder operation. General Motors went in an entirely different direction with DFM. This really is one of the most interesting innovations in V8 engines in a long time. This engine can operate as a two-cylinder engine or an eight-cylinder engine or a three or a four or a five or a six or a seven-cylinder engine anywhere in that ratio. More interesting than that, it can effectively operate with fractional cylinders as well. If you're thinking that this sounds an awful lot like the skip fire technology that Delphi was trying to license manufacturers for a while, you're right. The origin of this technology is the same basic patent, but General Motors licensed it from the original patent owner rather than from Delphi themselves. The key to DFM's fuel saving technology is that it can fire the cylinders in patterns. So instead of disabling the same four cylinders every time, it will actually skip around as it disables cylinders. So it will fire one cylinder, then skip one cylinder, then fire one cylinder, then skip one cylinder. Or it can fire one, skip two, fire one, skip three, fire one, skip four, and do those in any number of patterns. For instance, if you fire one cylinder and then skip two cylinders, fire one cylinder, skip two cylinders, etc., you've effectively created sort of a three cylinder V engine. The origin of the DFM engine's fuel savings is identical to regular cylinder deactivation, only it's magnified because it can stay in those cylinder deactivated modes longer. For instance, the seven cylinder mode operation or six cylinder mode operation are going to be a lot less noticeable to the average consumer than operating in V4 mode. So it will still be able to save you more fuel under a wider ratio of situations. And this will transition modes faster than the previous generation system did as well. It is truly unnoticeable with this engine. General Motors decided not to give you a light in the cabin because this engine can use so many different firing patterns that the number would be constantly changing. It is constantly deciding exactly what is best for fuel efficiency and for power delivery. When it comes to front seat comfort, I'm gonna give these seats seven out of 10 points. These are not quite as adjustable as some of the competition seats. For instance, we don't have four-way adjustable lumbar support, and we don't have the anti-fatigue function that we find in the F-150's front seats available in their top end trims. This truck is over $60,000. So at this price point in some of the competition, you would find those other features. We do, however, have a two position seat memory over there. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion. 
As you'd expect out of a big American pickup truck, the rear seats are large and comfortable. I have a decent amount of headroom, probably about three or four inches. We are in the model with the optional moonroof, and I have probably about eight or nine inches of legroom left. Now, one thing that I did notice is that the storage area under this seat is not quite as large as what we find in the Ram, so I was not able to fit my baby chainsaw right under there, which I do think is a bit of a pity. Hopping on the inside, the model that we're driving has a pretty standard sized moonroof right there over the driver and front passenger's heads. The driver and front passenger's headrests have the AT4 logo embroidered on them, and then we get this unique leather treatment on the inside as well. The tan patches in the seat back and seat bottom cushion are one of the prime differences between the AT4 and getting one of the other trims and then adding the off-road option packages to it. The AT4 also gets contrasting stitching on the dash and front door panels, but the overall interior parts quality remains constant across the lineup. Overall interior parts quality is also pretty common between the GMC and the Silverado. A lot of folks were asking about that. Indeed, the overall interior design is largely shared between the two vehicles. On the passenger side, we have the dual glove box arrangement that we've seen in the Sierra for a while. We have this very small upper section. I was barely able to fit some of the smaller smartphones in there. Larger ones might not fit. And then we have a bin style glove compartment below that. I was able to fit a tablet computer inside there, but some of the larger tablet computers wouldn't be able to fit. In the middle of the dashboard, we have a touchscreen infotainment system, which features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration. This system is very easy to use, although it's not quite as snazzy as the large screen that we see available in the top end trims of the Ram. This particular model has the optional factory navigation and, of course, the Wi-Fi hotspot integrated as well. It is very, very intuitive as far as the user operation goes, and it has a nice, crisp 360-degree camera view, which I really appreciate. This is a pretty big vehicle, and navigating it around some of these tighter trails that we've been driving on can get a little bit tricky. You may end up backing up an awful lot, and this is going to make that an awful lot easier. There are a variety of different views here that you can cycle through to help you out. We also have a trailering view right there, so you can back up your trailer a little bit more easily. This unique one right here where you can see sort of a bird's eye view from the front. Obviously, this is a digitally manipulated image that's placing the vehicle right there. We get something similar on the sides right there combined view digitally and then we get a hitch down view so that we can actually see as you're connecting the ball to your trailer. Speaking of towing, this is definitely something that is near and dear to GMC's heart. We have an app integrated right here in the infotainment system where you can see the status of the truck, connections, trailer, etc. Maintenance for that trailer. We have checklists that you can review if you're the kind of person that loves checklists to make sure everything is done right. You can even click the little I button right over here to get a little diagram if you're an infrequent tower and you just want to be extra careful. Uh, we have a trailers option over here where you can actually add trailer profiles. These can also be uploaded and shared if you're a fleet user, so that way you can actually have the trailers go from vehicle to vehicle and keep track of things. And then we, over here we have settings, so you can have trailer detection alert, maintenance alert, security alert, etc. And then finally, there is an app available on your smartphone that you can actually use to have the vehicle go through your lights checklist so you can make sure your trailer is properly connected. So it'll actually blink the turn signal left, right, etc. so that we can make sure those are connected single-handedly without getting someone out there to let you know that those lights are working. Overall, this software is not quite as fully featured as Uconnect in the Ram 1500, but I do find it definitely a step above what we see in the Ford F-150, both in terms of looks and overall functionality. Below the screen, we have some physical controls for that infotainment system, along with a knob over here that you can use to actually interact with those options if you're wearing gloves and you don't want to actually have to take them off to interact with that. We have our dual zone climate controls right here. You'll also find the controls for the heated and ventilated front seats, and then a row of buttons down below that. Some of you had questions about the differing rows of buttons. GMC told us that their button bank needed to have buttons in specific formats, so that's why if you don't get all the options that you see right here, we do get that button to raise and lower the windows because they wanted to stick a button in there without really having a button blank. Here we have lane keeping assist, parking sensors, disable enable system for the auto start stop, a button to drop the tailgate in the back, hazard lights, trash control off, button to turn on and off the 120 volt power inverter, and then the hill descent control. Continuing down, we have the integrated trailer brake controller, definitely a must for anybody that's going to do regular towing. Two USB inputs, USB-C and then a regular USB port. We then have a 12-volt power port and a 120-volt AC port. A really nice touch with this infotainment software is that you don't have to have the device connected right here. GM does give us a wide variety of different USB inputs, so you can actually keep your iPhone or smartphone locked away in the center console, away from prying eyes. Continuing down from there, we have a wireless charging mat for your smartphone. It is nice and large for those larger smartphones out there. 
storage compartment right over here. You can see that we have the key for the truck with auto start stop and a button to release that tailgate right there as well two large cup holders, and then the center section where you can store smartphones or other square items. The center console also has an area where you can store a smartphone, although that's not a wireless charging mat, and it opens to reveal, again, those two extra USB ports, SD card slot for the mapping database, auxiliary input, and then a lot of storage right there in the middle. We also have some file folder hangers on each side if you're the file folder kind of person. The steering wheel is a four-spoke design. On the left side, we have the controls for the cruise control system. You'll notice that even though we have a distance button here, this is not adaptive cruise control. It is just standard cruise control. This distance button is simply used for the collision warning system. You'll see the gap adjust right there in the LCD. We have a heated steering wheel button, and then you control that multifunction LCD via this control module over here on the right side of the steering wheel. We have a voice command button and a phone button. The volume up, down, and track up, down buttons are buttons on the back of the steering wheel. So we have volume up, down on this side, and then track up, down on the left. The instrument cluster is a partial LCD unit, so you can see we have a physical tachometer, physical speedometer, and then everything else in this particular model is being displayed by this color LCD right in the middle. This display is where we find things like our typical trip computer readouts, status of the vehicle active safety systems, trailer brake control, same sort of all-wheel drive information that we saw on the heads-up display, and those auxiliary gauges that we see right along the top. You can also get the status of your Bluetooth connected phone or navigation turn by turn directions. The Sierra gets GM's latest heads up display. This is a full color unit and it's definitely a lot crisper than what we see in the rest of GM's lineup, including their Cadillac models as well. This gives us things like the status of our four wheel drive system. You can see it's in four wheel drive mode right there. If I shift it over to two wheel drive mode, that'll change or put it in all wheel drive mode. This display is also used for turn by turn navigation directions the vehicle following distance, status of active safety systems, etc. This is not quite as fully featured as we find in some of the competition, but it is very easy to use, very easy to adjust. The most frequent question I got from all of you was about overall interior parts quality and how the Sierra and the Silverado compare with the competition from Ram and of course from Ford. The first thing that you'll notice on the inside of this truck is that we don't have the same kind of top end features that we find available in the Ram 1500 in their limited and of course the Longhorn interior. But on the flip side, base models of the Sierra and the Silverado compare very, very well to the Ram and the Ford F-150. I think that this interior overall feels more premium than the base interiors that we find in the Ford and about equal with the current generation base interiors in the Ram 1500. Of course, if we're talking about the absolute base interior in the Ram, which is the tradesman version, then the base interior in the Sierra is definitely a notch above. When we look over here on the dashboard, we definitely find similar amounts of soft touch materials to mid-level trims in the Ram. But the tricky bit is that by the time we work our way on up to the model that we're driving right here, which is over $60,000, by this point, you would find more premium materials in the Ram. For instance, on the dashboard, we don't find the available stitched leather dashboards and real wood trim that we do see on the inside of the Ram 1500, but the overall parts quality, again, is very comparable to those mid-level trims. GMC designers were quick to point out that the interior materials inside the Sierra are going to be a little bit more durable long-term and a little bit easier to clean than the leather dashboard that we find in the Ram 1500. And while that is definitely true, this, again, does not feel quite as premium. When it comes to off-roading, there's nothing terribly extreme about the AT4. And by that I mean that this is, again, not a Ford Raptor. But what it is, is a tastefully done, well-integrated off-road package that reminds me a lot of the Ram 1500 Rebel. Like the AT4, the Ram Rebel is a step above the average off-road package, but not quite what we see in the F-150 Raptor. Although it is worth noting that the Rebel only gets a one-inch factory lift versus what we see in the AT4. The one major advantage to the Ram 1500 in this particular face-off is that the Rebel is available with a four-corner air suspension. Now that's optional, not standard in the Rebel. The air suspension doesn't change the axle clearance. It's still going to be the same whether you get the air suspension or not, but what it does improve is the approach, breakover, and departure angles when the suspension is elevated to its maximum ride height. When the Ram 1500 suspension is not at its maximum ride height, it helps improve the overall ride quality versus what we see in the 1500 Sierra. The other benefit to the air suspension is that when it's at its normal height, it definitely helps improve the overall ride quality versus what we see in the Sierra 1500, definitely in the Sierra 1500 AT4. On the downside, of course, the Ram 1500's air suspension is going to pose a higher maintenance cost long term in that vehicle because there will be a point where you will have to replace those air struts and they could be relatively expensive versus the regular off-road shocks that we see in the Sierra. 
Overall, the biggest thing that you'll notice about the AT4, whether you're off-road or on-road, is how well balanced the vehicle is overall. It's a quiet daily commuter. Overall efficiency does drop a little bit versus the regular Sierra, but only by about one mile per gallon in our tests. Overall handling isn't quite as sharp as it is in other trims, but again, the factory engineers have worked hard to make sure that it still feels like a Sierra. That factory polish is the big thing that you get when you choose something like the AT4 or the Rebel over the do-it-yourself aftermarket upgrades. Now, when it comes to specifically off-roading, it's important to remember that the AT4 is big. During my day off the beaten path near home, I managed to get it stuck. Not because of mud or rocks, but simply because it was too big to turn around when I had to. Even when attempting a 100 point turn, I ended up having to back all the way down the hill with my tail between my legs to a point where I could actually turn the AT4 around. That's the real downsize to the AT4 or really any full size off-road truck compared to something like a Jeep Wrangler is that they're all going to be enormous. Now something like the Chevy Colorado in its high-end ZR2 off-road package, that's going to be an awful lot easier to take on narrower trails, tighter trails than something like the AT4. If you're looking to conquer Moab or run the Baja 1000, the AT4 just isn't going to be the truck for you. You're going to want more serious modifications than we see here. And if that's really the goal for you when you're out there shopping for a new truck, then you should just skip this model and then do those mods yourself aftermarket because you'll end up saving money. Be sure to let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below and let me know if you were shopping in this segment, what would you do? And as always, be sure and find us over at facebook.com slash alexnauto so you can see what we're driving this week. Click up there to the top of your screen if you want to support this channel, and I'll see you later.